Welcome clients and guests to my channel. I'm Jason Saro and I'm a licensed professional counselor. My videos are designed to educate and empower you to make informed decisions about your mental health. Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, volume three of my DBT series. In my first two videos, I went over uh, a general outline of what DBT is and I covered uh, the fact that it's evidence-based and what populations and conditions the, the, the literature states it is effective for. And I also covered uh, how DBT actually works. And so today in volume three, I'm going to go over the four components of dialectical behavioral therapy. And the first one is what we call mindfulness skills. Mindfulness is noticing what's around you, observing, paying attention, noticing what's in your mind and body. And as we go to the next slide uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, it will talk about what those mindfulness skills are. The second component of DBT is what they call interpersonal effectiveness skills. And it's similar to assertiveness training. Interpersonal skills focus on how to ask for what you need, saying no, and effectively managing inevitable conflict. Increasing your ability to accurately assess a situation and to appropriately determine what you're aiming at and how to hit the bullseye. Barriers can include emotional vulnerability, which has been determined to be a biological predisposition or temperament where an individual is born more emotionally sensitive than most people. And that's attributed mostly to genetics or trauma during fetal development. So you'll often see two people experiencing the same impact, maybe from the environment, and they respond maybe completely differently. And one of the reasons behind that is because of the innate emotional vulnerability that one may have or sensitivity that one may have more than the other. So a, a similar situation happens to two people and one of them reacts more strongly or has a reaction that isn't necessarily in line with what the stressor really was or what it or the response that it was called for it could be uh, elevated or uh, unnecessary emotion regulation skills is about resisting the urge to act on a harmful behavior understanding the connection between thoughts emotions and behaviors distress tolerance skills are about accepting emotions and validating the experience. You may hear me say that a lot, that your emotions are not just feeling words. It's not that you just feel frustrated, but that your whole body, your whole existence has this experience. And we want to acknowledge all the components of them. And skills training for DBT was, can, can be about a year. And you'll see DBT in psychiatric hospitals. You'll see them in intensive outpatient programs for both adolescent and adults. And you'll see it in out, outpatient providers can also provide this module. As an outpatient provider, I provide this model and it's not always done from A to Z. It, has, uh, it does have some adapted parts to it because I do pull certain, certain uh, skills from other models that I think are more important in those moments than the actual skill. That's just my style. Some people will do DBT with fidelity. I, I don't. Mindfulness skills have two main components, what they call the what skills and the how skills. So the what skills start with observing and attending to events observing your emotions and observing other behavioral responses. Experience it without trying to change it. And what you would do is you, you would observe, I see two people arguing with each other. That's observing, that's, that's noticing. What we also have with that is uh, the five senses exercise. So what we would do is if you feel dysregulated in some way, a way to be mi mindful and to, to calm yourself down is you would pick out five things that you see. So I would do it right now. I see a whiteboard, I see a fan, I see a water bottle, I see a chair, and I see blinds. 
four sounds you hear, and I would, I would listen to the, the sounds. I would probably close my eyes while, while doing this. I would hear a car going by. I would hear an AC unit. Maybe a door is closing. And maybe the, the sound of my own breath. Three things that you feel. And what you would do is you just simply take something that has some sort of texture. So I have my chair here that has some texture. Uh, I'm grabbing my water bottle. It has, and, and, you and you're mindful of what it actually feels like. Because everything that you're doing in the moment is second by second. And when I'm doing this, when I'm focusing on what this bottle feels like, there is nothing about my past that is bringing me down and I am not anxious at all about my future because I'm not thinking about it and I'm acknowledging what this second is bringing me. To really living in the moment. Uh, another thing what you would do is two things that you smell and one thing that you taste. And so you would, you would do this purposeful uh, behavior to make sure that you, you are grounded and stay present. And that is especially if you start to feel like you're, you're getting upset or you're getting too emotional. It's a way to really ground yourself. Describing. Describing is not taking emotions and thoughts literally. Confusion exists when we attach a physiological response from fear with the environment. If I feel fear, it doesn't mean the situation is life-threatening. So just because you're afraid or scared does not mean that there is some sort of threat around you. Thoughts are confused with facts. I have an exam today. I'm definitely going to fail. So, to make a, so the, this example, the person is drawing a conclusion because of, of a fact. I have an exam today. I'm definitely going to fail. And that is what we would call in CBT a catastrophic thought. There's nothing really worse. Or maybe uh, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail out of school. I'm going to be a complete loser. That would be like a vertical arrow all the way towards catastrophizing. So we don't want to do those things. We don't want to confuse thoughts with facts. Spontaneous action. Participation that is smooth and based partly on habit. For example, driving home on familiar roads while being mindful of what's around you during the drive. The how skills is about non-judgmentally noticing your experience and narrating it. Do you judge yourself, others, or both? Judgment refers to determining if someone or something is positive or negative. You put labels on things. You may say things like, that's good, that person's crazy, I'm not normal, I'm broken, What's wrong with you? Negative, negative judgments come from painful experiences. Feeling hurt or angry can evoke judgments. Judging usually increases the intensity of emotions, causing a cycle. I can't believe how stupid I am for not setting my alarm. I can't even do the simplest things in life because I'm so dumb. Say how you feel about something and leave out the labels. I'm really annoyed I didn't set my alarm because now I have to go to work late. I feel so lonely. I'm getting that pit in my stomach again and I'm starting to get worried and scared. So you're saying how you, how you feel about something without a label. My heart is also racing and I'm worried I'm going to have a panic attack. Observing whether your experience is more internal, external, or both. Internal is the awareness of what your thoughts, feelings, and sensations are. External is the awareness the environment, of the environment and what is happening outside of yourself. Continuing down the, the how skills, rather than splitting attention on more than one activity, focus on the present activity. Individuals with emotion regulation difficulties are often distracted by mood, anxiety, and the movements of the environment in their eyesight. Be effective, not right. The inability to let go of being right in favor of achieving goals. Playing the game and doing what works. Remember, be effective. Don't concentrate on getting the last word or being right. It's not effective sometimes. 
So we have some additional mindfulness skills. The goal is to reduce emotional reactivity, and there's three styles of thinking. This is one of my favorite concepts, and it's called Wise Man. It has three, three, three steps to it. It has your reasoning, rational self, your emotional self, and your wise self. This is a really good problem-solving activity, and I really suggest doing this when you have a dilemma. So our logical side, with our logical side, emotions are removed. Thinking about organizing your day, what job or house tasks are required for the day, you're just objectively picking out like what the, what the facts are, what you have to do. It's very task-oriented at times. That's your, so that's your rational or logical side. The emotional side is the fact that emotions can create behaviors. So if I feel angry, I may snap at someone. I'm only snapping at you because I feel angry. Feeling anxious and avoiding or procrastinating. So I'm procrastinating because I am anxious about the future. I'm avoiding it because I just don't want to do it. But you know, you see how those two work together. I'm feeling depressed and isolating or withdrawing. Well, the reason why I'm withdrawing or isolating is because I feel depressed. Those two are interconnected. We add the third component of wise self. This is the combination of the reasoning self, the emotional self, and we add in intuition. And I love talking about intuition. Wise self is the ability to properly assess the situation and take the best course of action that suits the set of circumstances. So for example, you're in an argument with your partner and you bite your tongue because you know it will only add fuel to the fire. You have an urge to drink, but a part of you knows there's a better way to cope, so you call your sponsor or attend an AA meeting. That's your wise self. You're able to quickly reframe your initial thoughts and impulses and make healthier choices. Another example, you wake up and you don't feel like going to the gym, but you get up and go anyway. So you might wake up and say, oh, I've got to go to the gym today. I have an, I have an appointment with my trainer. Oh, I just don't feel like going. And you know what that's like. A lot of us know what that's like. We want to go back to bed. But then you come back and you use your intuition. And you're kind of like, well, I know I feel better when I go. I know last time I had the same feeling. And I, and I got my ass up out of bed and I went and I felt better. And my whole day was so productive. That is your wise self overriding that emotional, um, maybe negativity. Uh, Davin De Becker uh, is an author and he wrote the book, The Gift of Fear where he talks about how this woman was, who lived in, a, I think, a three-story apartment building. And she came home, and I think she went grocery shopping or something. And she saw, she saw this, uh, this man, and, and he might have been a neighbor. She might have known him, maybe seen him once or twice, but didn't know him. And when she first saw him, and he asked her, hey, do you want some help bringing the grocery, groceries up to, to your apartment? Her intuition was telling her that something was off. She didn't know exactly what, but she just kind of had that, that maybe um, that primal intuition. Something's not right with this guy. And as she, and the, he goes on to talk, I, I believe, in detail about how she gets to the first, second floor, and then she, she has even more of her intuition is almost like screaming at her, say no, say you know, just put the groceries down. I'll take it from here, and she ignores her intuition. And, get, and she gets to the third floor and she gets to her door and ultimately she opens, she, she does open the door when he, he suggests that he'll just bring in the groceries and put, it, put them next to the, to the fridge or something like that and then he'll leave. And she, the whole time her intuition is screaming, get out of there, say no, tell him you've got this. And she ignores it. And that was her wise self. Her wise self was talking to her. And the... Uh, the, the good news is, is that she, I believe in this story, she escaped harm. Uh, he did attempt to harm her, but she escaped it. Uh, but again, the main purpose is follow your intuition. Even if you are wrong in some situations, it's better to be wrong uh, about something and maybe be embarrassed a little bit than to ignore that part of you. And the last part of mindfulness I'm going to talk about is radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is tolerating something without judging it or trying to change it. If you're judging yourself, your experience, or someone else in the present moment, then you're not really paying attention to what's happening in that moment. 
you're going to miss something. Judging others can make us angry. Judging ourselves can make us depressed. So again, I appreciate you all watching this video. Um, tune into the next video, which will be released soon. Uh, be where you are. Be resilient.